We have this mission. You can get on board and it's going to be rough. But if you get what we get, then come join us and let's go do this thing. Happiness is better shared. If everything goes according to the hyper Bitcoinization plan, like you are going to be the person in your group of 30 or 40 people with this incredibly high net worth that you could provide generational wealth to for 30, 40 people. And you can either just give them the Bitcoin and buy them houses, or you can be a leader and instruct them on how to be sovereign or how to, you know, come together as a unity. You can't really have freedom of speech if you're just relying on a government to grant you that right. The only way that you truly have freedom of speech is if you become a sovereign individual yourself, not ever putting all your eggs in one basket in terms of what your skill sets are. It's trying to learn as many skills as you can to be sovereign. People are increasingly feeling powerless because they can't have property rights. It's just one person you care about at a time getting them out of that fiat system. The new frontier is the internet. There is real estate on the internet and that's what Bitcoiners are doing is they're saying, hey, I'm stacking the sats and now I have a stake in this new monetary system. If you get to a state where you're saying more statements at a ratio of like 10 to 1 than you are asking questions, then you should take a look at yourself. Are you nomadic and move around a lot or you have a home base? It feels like I'm nomadic lately. I think this year I have not been at home for at least two and a half, almost three months. I've been to Madeira. We were just in Nashville, New York, Chicago. Savannah, Georgia. I've been down at Cancun. I'm going to Japan in a few weeks. Um, who knows from there? Um, but it's fun. Like that is kind of the unique situation I've been put in is that I can do my part to give to the Bitcoin community and also travel the world and learn about different cultures. And the hope is that I can bring all those lessons that I've taken from my travels and, and bring them into the videos. I love it a lot. Really cool. And you're also the, the, the co-founder of, of Get Based. So with that, we can directly uh, start into that. Um, I heard the, the Get Based, like uh, being based, that term, uh, before not that much. Now I hear it all the time since, <laughs> since, since I heard uh, you saying it and, and the company of, that you built it. Um, what's your definition of based? Like what, what, what's a based person? What's, what's the definition of the, the term? Um. I think it's about being unapologetically authentic. So people have different de definitions as to like, what is a based opinion? Usually in the context of the internet, it's like maybe a controversial opinion that holds like a lot of truth that people are afraid to say. For me, for the individual, it is about like, if you have a strong opinion about something, it's about standing by that opinion through thick and thin, not letting the tides of like social change or, you know, a majority of other people's opinions change what you really think about something. So yeah, it's about just it based. It's literally just means grounded. So grounding yourself in the things that you actually believe and the values that you believe. Which basically would say like al almost every Bitcoiner is, is based as long as he's, he's an open Bitcoiner, right? <laughs> I think so. I, I think the Bitcoiners really take to that term a little bit more because I think that Bitcoin itself is a protocol based on like undeniable truths, you know, in mathematics, the ledger, once a block is confirmed, it's, it's the truth forever, basically. Um, and so Bitcoiners like to ground themselves in, you know, as, as much truth of this as they can. There's a lot of subjectivity in life, um, you know, where you can debate whether something is good or bad. Um, but there's also a lot of objectivity. And I think what Bitcoiners gravitate towards is like finding that objective truth, the objective good in the world and trying to promote it out to as many people as possible and share those values. And sometimes those things that we view as objective good are things that are not so savory, uh, right? Like in the, in the, you know, public, public sphere, we, we might be pushing things like personal responsibility, the fact that maybe we shouldn't blame the government or the Fed, or the other political party for everything, and that we should take responsibility for ourselves. That might not be something that everybody wants to hear. But I think that's a pretty base thing to say, ultimately, responsibility lies as much as humanly possible with the individual for the outcome of their actions. Um, and yeah, Long story short, that's that's what I think based is all about. Do, do you feel like the saying what you want and being uh, truthful to yourself and truthful to the, to the world, uh, especially online, and is 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 that freedom of speech kind of in in danger, or is it even even there? I think I mean we have X that's kind of get got a little bit more free. 
uh, but there's also Nostra where you can really freely speak, uh, but there's not the mainstream crowd on Nostra, so there are like no, nobody, not, not so many people are listening there. Is that in danger? I think I also heard a little bit about the UK doing something, but I did not look into it deeply, if, if you looked into it deeply, but uh, I think they, there's someone got arrested for saying something online. I, I did not look deeply what they did, but um, what's your opinion here? Yeah, I mean, freedom of speech is something that I think every society should um, work towards to attain. But it also is not in the best interest of every single society. I know that that kind of sounds a little bit weird, but like there are people who live under dictatorships. There are people that live in very highly religious countries where total freedom of speech is just not tolerated by the majority of the population. They do not want people to speak their mind because they feel like it might hinder their religion or it might hinder another belief. Um, in the West, we say that we value it a lot. You know, we, we have it enshrined in the Constitution in the United States. I don't know what Canada's version of this is. I don't think that we have like the same freedom of speech protections. I think we're a little bit more aligned with the UK, which, yeah, it's been a bit more controversial. You can't, you know, slander certain entities, I guess. Um, but ultimately, like these things that we call human rights, like freedom of speech, these things rest in the individual and you can't really have freedom of speech if you're just relying on a government to grant you that right. The only way that you truly have freedom of speech is if you become a sovereign individual yourself. If I'm in America and I can get fired, I can get my bank account, my, my basic ability to, to transact mon money censored because I say something that falls under the guise of freedom of speech, but it's just not liked by middlemen that essentially control everything, um, then I don't really have freedom of speech. Right. Like if I cannot say certain political views without fear of losing my employment, with fear of being let go from a certain school, with fear of being let go from a certain family, like it's not it's not really a human right, is it? Right. I'm not re I'm not really given that right. Like, yeah, I'm given that right. But with the expense of all the consequences of possibly being alienated from everyone. So freedom of speech, again, it's not freedom from consequence. It's about being able to say what you you know want to say in a, in a public sphere without the fear of um, you know retaliation or without the fear of, of being needlessly censored. But ultimately, like we can enshrine these things in, in founding documents, but they are not you know immovable laws like the laws of gravity or or the laws of physics. Right? Uh, it's to each their own, and I think it's all about as an individual, you have to harness the right people around you and you have to harness the right tools around you to actually be able to exercise things like freedom of speech as much as possible. That's what Bitcoin enables, right? Uh, yeah. it's a, I love it a lot. Um, what are you doing to, to be as sovereign as possible? Are you, you're living in Canada? Yes. Uh, what, what, what can we do to, to be, or what are you doing to be uh, as sovereign uh, and as untouchable as possible? It's tough. I think it really depends. You know, I, I don't think my lifestyle is necessarily for everyone, but what is it to be sovereign? To be sovereign is to, to have as many tools as possible on your tool belt of being able to survive, basically, right? What are survival skills? Well, being able to feed yourself, um, being able to take care and raise a family, you know, to raise others or to, you know, have personal responsibility, to be able to craft things, I think, with your hands. To, to be able to speak fluently and persuasively in order to, you know, get the things that you need or want or to negotiate properly in certain situations, um, you know, to have the freedom to transact, to be sovereign, you have to not be able to have one singular choke point to your transactional capabilities. I, I think it's like, it's all about not ever putting all your eggs into one basket in terms of what your skill sets are. It's trying to learn as many skills as you can to be sovereign. Um, on the other hand, and this is like a really important thing that I, I've taken away is like, as much as we might aspire to be sovereign individuals, we, we cannot possibly flourish on our lonesome. We have to learn how to cooperate with other people. We have to learn how to barter, how to exchange our time and goods and energy and how to value and, and price out that energy uh, that we exchange with other people who can do things that maybe we can't because of physical circumstances or just talent or other abilities. We don't have, you know... If we want to listen to music, for example, or sovereign individuals, like we have to find someone who can play us music or we have to purchase music or we get it for free off the internet, but you still got to pay for that internet with something, right? So you have to be able to be good at exchanging your time for the things that you want and being able to create as many things as you can with your own time is also a big plus. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting conversation because uh, like, total freedom means you are alone in this world because there's always like dependency on, on other people 
uh, there is a like uh, I rent, so there's a landlord who who knows where I live and and, and knows some details about me. Like that's like a, a major dependency that that I have. And there's so many other things that we are depending on. Like uh, <laughs> if you really want to be 100% free and independent of everything, you basically have to live in the woods and and eat from from the grass and and from the from uh, animals that uh, come by or like that. And even there, you are kind of <laughs> depending on something to <laughs> to find something for for food, and, and maybe there uh, you need a, a second person that looks out for you when you sleep. Like I think the the the, the concept of of full freedom is an interesting one because um, we don't want to be one hundred percent free. This means that we are one hundred percent rely on, on ourselves. Like it's good that we cooperate and and, and mm-hmm. have have some dependencies. Uh, between each other and uh, that's that's really good but th- then well, we come to the other con- yeah please go ahead well this might be a really good segue because i used to to have that and i think this is something i i like to talk about like difference between sexes and genders and and, and like you know what makes men different from women i think one thing that makes men very distinctly different from women and there might be some exceptions to this is that every guy that i know of has had a dream of just like ripping up the passport, ripping up the ID, booking it into the woods with a gun and just trying to see if they could survive. I don't think many women like dream of that or even think about it, but like every guy I know has kind of thought about doing that once. Some of them have tried it, some version of that. Um, And it's a very like isolationist kind of thing, but I think we all go through it as we grow up and we become men like this, this idea that like, screw it. Like maybe I just don't need everyone else and I can just do it on my own. But I think part of becoming a man and becoming a a grown adult is learning that personal responsibility, having people rely on you and you relying on other people is not necessarily a bad thing. And and one of my favorite movies, um, I'll try not to spoil it too much, but my favorite movie of all time is this movie called Into the Wild. Um, It's based off of the true story of Christopher McCandless, this kid who basically did that. He chopped up his ID, his passport, just after graduating college, I believe, a really smart kid decides to hitchhike up across America all the way up to Alaska and, and try and like survive in the wilderness there. And, uh, you know, the end of the story is him basically learning that happiness is better shared, right? Life is better shared. You cannot enjoy the fruits and really take for granted everything that the world has to offer if you try and do it all by yourself. Um, and, uh, so there's that, there's that balance between like, I want to be as sovereign, as sovereign of an individual as possible. I don't want to rely on my parents or my, my, my girlfriend or my wife or my friends. Like I want to be able to do everything myself, but also realizing that it's good that you have those things. And the reason that you have those things that you can rely on other people for is because you're also giving them something in return that they probably can't get elsewhere. That's an interesting thing. Yeah. The, the, the topic of, uh, of gender is, is really interesting and never covered it on the podcast. <laughs> and I think that it would be great to, to dive into that. Um, <laughs> I will just, uh, I will just ask that, and I think the, uh, we can get from there. Why are there only two genders? Why are there only two genders? I don't know. It's like this is a long, this is a long thing. It's like, look, you, you, you want to call yourself like you, you are entitled to label yourself whatever you want. Nobody else has to take your definition seriously, right? Like. You know, you can say I am a, uh, you know, I am a, a a woman, and if you call me a man, you're like misgendering me. It's like okay, like so be it. Like I'm gonna be misgendering you for the rest of your life because you look like a dude to me. Um, and there's a double standard where like you can't call yourself black or you can't call yourself 20 when you're age like 60. It's like, look, you, you the physical features you are, you have your definitions of them of, of who you are, and then you have the public perception definitions of who you are. Um, and you can't change what other people think you can try, you can try under force of law. Well, that's the craziest part about all this, you know, gender stuff is like, they are trying to give individuals through, through the power of law, the, the ability to change what other people's definitions are of yourself, which is crazy. It's like, if I wanted my pronouns to be like handsome and smart, um, you know, and if you don't call me those, you go to jail, like that seems absurd. But if you, if, if I want my pronouns to be like, she, her, and you don't call me those, you do go to jail in certain countries, right? It's like, where are these, how many pronouns are there? Where are they coming from? Like who invents what the definition of a pronoun is? It's all, it's all kind of crazy, but it's all a distraction. That's the big thing. It's all one gigantic distraction from the fact that our time and our energy is being robbed. Um, I look at all these like social and cultural issues and it's like, 
guys, like if we spent just like a tenth of the energy, if the conservatives and the liberals spent just a tenth of the energy that they spend fighting over abortion law, if they spent a tenth of the energy that they spend fighting over like misgendering or mispronouncing on just learning how money works, which is the actual most important thing, because that's what we're all we all have in common. We're all working towards is to accrue value with our time. If you just spend a tenth of that time working towards understanding that stuff, we would find way more common ground. We would actually get to solving some of these uh, these cultural issues because we would be grounded in in a singular mission, which is to preserve the value of our time, our legacies. But instead, you know, media implantation, uh, you know humans that just get riled up by stuff like we just spend our time on silly stuff and uh as a bitcoiner that's like the, that's the orange pill thing right like you take the pill and then you get to see it all from the outside um that's you know what we're all in it for is we want to orange pill the world so that they can start to see all these issues through a different lens altogether and, and see them for the distractions or the noise that they are and try and corral as many people as possible to actually work towards a common human goal which is to preserve the value that we create with our time Absolutely, yeah. Is that, would you say, is this uh, gender and, and all those things that you just described something that comes from fear or it's actually like a kind of a distraction from the fiat system? Like is, 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 is the fiat system and an cause of that because uh, the cheap money people are acting out uh, uh, because of reasons and, and or is it an actual like distraction from that that we don't get to see the, the real thing? I think there's like some intentional manufacturing of this like not knowing your identity thing, but I do think it's a symptom of a system that perpetually robs from people. And I guess like, just give me a second to kind of like think this through because I don't want to, I, I want to get it kind of concise. I think essentially um, people are increasingly feeling powerless because they can't have property rights, right? It is almost impossible to own the things that our parents owned, like houses, like cars, and the things that we do get in, you know, now that our parents didn't degrees, we have to accumulate debt towards another entity too. So we not only have like um, a lack of property rights, we have negative property rights because everybody is in debt. And when you have negative property rights, when you feel like you don't really own the labor of your time and, and then all the energy of your time is going towards paying off something that you did in the past, like you feel like a slave. You feel like you don't have individuality. You feel like you're a cog in the machine just working to pay off a degree or a car debt or whatever. And so it's no surprise to me that like in this world where people feel like, you know, they're basically being imprisoned by a monetary system that they lash out and try and find some semblance of meaning in different sorts of communities. Right. And so maybe my way of coping with the fact that all of my time is being stolen uh, by a debt based system is by thinking that I am somebody else, thinking that I'm a different gender, connecting with other people that are trying to just be a part of a different system altogether. And so when I see all these different movements of like different gender identities, when people join cults and all these things, it's just, it's just people's way of, of trying to feel like they aren't just like a cog in the system, that they aren't just like replaceable. They want to feel like they're a part of something bigger, you know? And, and when I, when I see people that, you know, get all the hormones and stuff, I don't think that they're like, you can argue that they're, they're mentally ill and, and things like that. But I think these are just people that are looking for meaning And these communities of like LGBTQ and all that, they're like very, very supportive. Like you have a family in these people. We might look at them as like strange, but like go and listen to the camaraderie that is in these groups. Go and listen to the camaraderie that is in certain cults. Like it gives you something to aspire for. It gives you rules. It gives you like energy. Um, it's just not in the way that maybe us Bitcoiners, you know, would say is the optimal way of getting that. But I think that's why people seek these things out, right? They want to feel a part of something. Everybody is is dying for meaning. We've just had meaning sapped from us because we're just enslaved, right? And so it's just different people gravitate towards different things. Um, the thing is, is that people just don't get the root of why we're enslaved. And if, if we got that, if we get on to a common ground where we understand that this is a system that's enslaving us, We could all come together and work to undo that system. But unfortunately, like we just want to get through the next day. And it's so hard to pull people um, in the direction of actually fighting the system and, and working towards this long, long term solution that will require a lot of sacrifice to get right. How long do you think this this uh 
can last. I feel, I feel like the this this fiat system is there's like one it has a major network effect to it. Like people are really used to it, and and they are like if you are today like forty five years old, uh, you only lived in the fiat system, and and you know okay that that thing that I have in my hand, which is has no value at all, has value. <laughs> like you learned that from from the day you were born. Um, it's, it's maybe, maybe it's different for people that are like born like five, 10 years ago, because they always lived in a world where at least the alternative existed, uh, and, and something that was not like gold, <laughs> even though gold is an alternative to that, but, uh, not really f uh, suitable for a digital and global world. Um, how long do you think can this, this fiat system, this fiat monster, um, live and is, is, or will it? ever be like defeated uh, if we stay in that term honestly like i'll give you my real honest opinion on this is i don't know and frankly like i don't care like w we can postulate on how long the system is going to last or we can just pretend that it's already over and just try and bring as many people as we can to a parallel system that's what jeff booth talks about right like this is the one thing that frustrates me about bitcoiners a lot of the time is like the the bull case for their freedom is that like everything collapses around them like fiat finally collapses the wool is finally removed like we finally have the revolution we end the central bank it's like we know these things can go on over and over and we know human psychology we know these patterns of like corralling people like leaders will always be able to instill fear in enough people to get you know the things that they want so for me it's like i don't concern myself with when this system might collapse temporarily before it's, you know, rebuilt anew all over again. I worry, or I, I don't worry, but I think mostly about who are the people in my life that I really, really care about and how can I get them out of this system as easily as possible? And are they willing to open their minds and come out of the system with me? And, and like, I think when I had that shift of thought of like, you know, when is the macro going to change to like, you know, when can I change my friends and family or, or when are they going to take the leap to, to try and do what I'm doing? Um, that's when I realized like those are attainable things. I don't have to postulate or, or like theorize on when things are going to change. I can actually just do the change now. That's why I make the videos that I make. That's why I talk to Bitcoin with everyone that I know. And it's just like, it's just one person you care about at a time, getting them out of that fiat system. And you make the videos so that hopefully other people that you don't know directly will learn from them. Um, you make the videos like I do because you just have fun making videos. Um, but you ultimately have to care most about the people around you that you love, the people around you that you respect and that respect you. And uh, just shut out the noise, you know, for the, the big macro because nobody really knows when this thing is going to end. You know, some people have speculations that the U.S. debt will get the GDP to debt will get too high or whatever. It's like, OK. It's like, what am I going to do with that? Right? Like I need to care about my parents and my friends. Like I don't, I'm not going to wait 40 years for this thing to crash in order to just tell my friends, I told you so. It's like, no, I'm going to figure this out today as much as I possibly can. And we'll work towards whatever we want to work towards. I, I love that because uh, focusing on, on building something rather than uh, focusing on, on t uh, tearing something down or fighting something is, is way more productive. Like it's way more productive to build something than to fight something, uh, because you give it your energy and, and the thing that you give energy towards uh, that, that, will, that is the thing that grows. Like if you find something, uh, the, the chances is that it gets more energy. And I, I like that the central banks and, and that, uh, ECP in, in the EU and, and, and things like that, they, they starting to fight Bitcoin this well, means they take it seriously well here's a good example of this is like you look throughout history of every time like a new civilization started there was like a defector from the current paradigm right think of like the british and the americans when the american empire started it was like a small faction of, of brits who were like yeah we don't like this taxation without representation they didn't try and like get everybody you know on that board they didn't try to persuade everybody that what the british government was doing was wrong they were like, we have this mission, you can get on board, we're going to cross the ocean, and we're going to start a new country. And it's going to be rough. But if you get what we get, then come join us and let's go do this thing. Right. 
And so that's like the Bitcoin attitude. Unfortunately, we don't have like, you know, all the land in the world is kind of claimed. So it's going to be hard to start a bit Bitcoin landia. But the new frontier is is the Internet. There is real estate on the Internet. And that's what Bitcoiners are doing is they're saying, hey, I'm stacking the sats. And now I have a stake in this new monetary system. It is a bet. It's not a sure thing, Bitcoin necessarily. But that's what the Bitcoiners are doing is they're they're pioneering. They're leaving the British, the fiat empire. And they're going towards a Bitcoin standard as much as they possibly can. And when the world is ready to join us, the world will be ready to join us. And, and we will, in some essence, you know, be leaders, but hopefully confidants in the people that, uh, you know, we have in our community to, to lead to a better place. So uh, Bitcoiners, like, we don't realize this. Like, you might just be a person, a man or woman, like stacking sats passively. But if you're consuming these podcasts and you're on Twitter, and you're doing like whatever you can to support, you know, Bitcoin's advancement, like there's a very real possibility that like one day you're going to have like 20 to 30 to 40 of your closest friends and family looking up to you to try and figure out like what to do if something comes crashing down. Let's just say like, again, I don't like to theorize too much, but like if you're the person who stacks sats vigorously and, and you work a nine to five, but you've been doing it for like three, four years and you own like one Bitcoin, if everything goes according to the, the hyper Bitcoinization plan, like you are going to be the person in your group of 30 or 40 people with this incredibly high net worth that you could provide generational wealth to for, you know, 30, 40 people. And you can either just give them the Bitcoin and buy them houses, or you can be a leader and instruct them on how to be sovereign or how to, you know, come together as a community. So I think we underestimate sometimes, like if all this goes according to plan, like we are not going to just be able to just, chill and stay humble and stack sats like we're gonna have to be leaders for our community because we saw something um and we we picked up a necessary tool in order to you know keep our communities safe and prosperous i'm i'm very positive that bitcoiners and i met so many already with the podcast um that they will use their purchasing power their financial energy they accumulated with bitcoin they, they will use it for something good uh, and productive at least that's my hope uh, mm -hmm. because uh, that's 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 the that's the thing right and and this is a really interesting thing because i uh, i say often on the podcast that if you stack and you want to try to get your family on but they don't want to get on uh, on bitcoin um be nice, stack for them, and be for be there for them if they actually need uh, need you. Because if it goes to according to plan and they are not willing to adopt Bitcoin, they will need you at some point. Uh, if if your family isn't, uh, I don't know, the the uh, one of the richest family alive, but even even if they are completely in a fiat system, even if they have a, a great measure of wealth, they they might still need your Bitcoin. Exactly. Hey, what you raise is a really good point, because if you have loving friends and family, like really loving, that would sacrifice things for you. I think true friendship is people who will sacrifice things for you and, and you would sacrifice things for them. If we're all wrong about this whole Bitcoin thing and we end up putting all our money into this whole thing and it goes to zero, like true friends and true family will not laugh in your face. They will help you get back up on your feet. But if you're right, you can change all your friends and family's life. So you're taking a bet on Bitcoin and yourself. But again, it's like surround yourself with good people because they are ultimately going to be there. If for some reason us Bitcoin psychopaths are wrong, you surround yourself with good people that care about you and you care about them, like they will be there for you. And you have that opportunity to give back if you're right. And you should give back if you're right. Is there anything that you can imagine that uh, brings Bitcoin down at this point? Yeah, it's if uh, central banks decide tomorrow, like, fuck it, we got to be fiscally responsible. We have children and grandchildren, and we need to create sound money. We need to link this to energy in some form. Maybe we don't like Bitcoin, but we're going to do another like rules-based system without rulers. And they somehow come up with like a really, really great version of a decentralized system that's similar to Bitcoin, but still has all like the decentralization that Bitcoin has. I, lo I know a lot of people are like, well, that's impossible. That's impossible. It's like, no, it's not. Like governments can also just be sound stewards of their community's money. Uh, it's a country by country basis. But I think like, you know, honestly, at this point, this is a controversial take. Controversial take like four on this show. I don't know how many have had, if they're controversial at all. But like El Salvador doesn't need Bitcoin. 
you know, El Salvador has what you might argue is like a dictator, but like you throw Bitcoin out, you just imagine that Bitcoin law never happened. Like everything that Bukele was working towards was going to happen anyways, right? Like increased safety, economic prosperity, like Bitcoin didn't need to be part of his plan for that whole country to thrive. I know that the Max Kaisers of the world will say that like they're interlinked and they're mandatory. It's like, no, that guy had a vision for his people. He rallied them together. The people really want to change. It just so happens that Bitcoin was one of the things that guy saw. And maybe there's some like increased tourism, but like there's no way in the world that you can tell me that if Bitcoin wasn't in his plan, that that country was, you know, going to remain in stasis with Bukele under the helm. There's just no way. Those people picked a new path and a new future for themselves when they elected Bukele. And, um, you know, Bukele has carried that energy forward. And, and Bitcoin echoes those values, but it, it, it is not the sole cause of them. And um, that's that's what we need ultimately. And, and if for some reason you start seeing other governments around the world elect real leaders and, and the people themselves decide it's time for a change and the people themselves themselves reorient themselves to have a like a, a long time preference then maybe we don't need bitcoin right or we don't need it right now right we just need people that understand the values that bitcoin has i just think that if you don't have sound money it's very hard to get those grounded values like sound money just incentivizes having those good values um, and it makes it you know easier to work towards that but if all of a sudden we just get our shit together then i don't think that we need bitcoin maybe necessarily that's but an interesting that's a stretch. Thing. That's a stretch. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I love it though. But um, uh, my best theory that I ever heard that uh, could bit, uh, bring Bitcoin down is that some superior life form like aliens come to our planet. If they come first to us before we come to them, it's fair to say that they are way more advanced than us. Basically uh, have a, a longer chain. They have a better chain. They have better money already. And they force basically their money onto us. So like th that's the only actual uh, theory that I'm like, yeah, that, that, that sounds, that sounds good. I mean, also that yours with, with government, um, but <laughs> I just have a really hard time. That, that's my bearish thesis on gold. What you just said, it's like aliens come down to earth. They see that we had this gold standard for a while. Maybe we're like still thinking about it. And they're like, wait a second. Like we know this like planet Romulus that has a ton of gold. Like we could just take over these chimps. You know, <laughs> they can't do that with Bitcoin, but, you know, maybe they'll just blow up the planet and then Bitcoin doesn't exist. Right. So <laughs> uh, that, that, that's true. Yeah. Really interesting. But uh, yeah, uh, on another note, uh, you made uh, together with Isa and Adam uh, a lot of uh, documentaries and they're really good. Like they are high quality. They're not just like, oh, yeah, 15 minutes video talking <laughs> the, the way that I do it, but really like high quality uh, and a lot of work into the every minute of, of, of the videos. Um, what did you uh, learn from, from those? I saw some with like you made something with Michael Saylor uh, where you uh, made like a person, I think that was like, half an hour long like read really in deep uh then you like vancouver in uh, with the bitcoin city and some others i saw i think peru i talked with with isa about that um it's really interesting where you made a lot of research probably with that uh, and and uh, the other two is is it just the three of you or is there more is there a team behind uh, actually well first of all thank you uh i'm really glad you appreciate the documentaries they're like a lot of work um but they're so like mm -hmm. I mean, I was making them for free for a reason because I just love making them. And then eventually I was like, well, I should like try not to sell all my Bitcoin to make these. So we'll try and like fund it. But yeah, it started out um, before Get Based. It was just Kinetic Finance. It was just me. And then there's, I don't want to go over the whole like how I met Adam and how I met Issa story, but like long story short, I did documentaries with them on like random DMs. I just randomly DM them out of the blue. Want to join me on a documentary? I like your stuff. They did. All of a sudden, I'm like, wait, we should just like make a company. You guys are awesome. Um, and then, yeah, now we have Get Based. And, and um, sorry, what was your initial question? Like, what have I learned from making them? If you watch or listen to my podcast on a regular basis, I guess you already bought some Bitcoin. And now the most important step is to keep 
their Bitcoin. Keep them secure in a hardware wallet. My personal recommendation for hardware wallet is the Bitbox. It's super secure. It's simple to set up. It's also a perfect gift for a friend who has still their Bitcoin on an exchange. And you can get a 5% discount with the code Robin at the checkout. Visit bitbox.swiss slash Robin to get your Bitbox. And if you really want to bulletproof your self-custody setup, your security setup, and maybe even your citizenship set up you have to talk to the bitcoin way if you go to the bitcoinway.com slash partners slash robin you get a 30 minute free call where you can dive deep with them if your self-custody setup is secure if your citizenship is secure or maybe might be improvable or your digital footprint in general is secure. They are the experts in cybersecurity, in Bitcoin self custody, and how to be a secure, sovereign individual in general. And last but not least, I have something completely new for you guys. I partnered up with Coin Vigilante. This is the most beautiful Bitcoin timepiece that I ever saw created by anyone. Look at that beauty. I love it so much. Coin Vigilante made a perfect Bitcoin watch. That's the perfect, subtle, elegant way to go out there and show that you are a Bitcoiner. And that watch brand is Bitcoin. Bitcoin only. Make sure to check out the link in the description for this amazing coin vigilante timepieces. Those watches are amazing. I love them so much. It was really hard for me to pick the one that I want to have because there are a lot of great options. I went with the new transparency edition. They are all limited. So grab yours. Those will not be available for a long time, but there will come new models and new amazing designs along the way. Yeah, um, I think... Uh, uh, with making videos, you have to do a lot of research. And I, I, I learned that with learning something, you learn a lot. But if you want to teach someone something, you have to learn way more yourself <laughs> in mm -hmm. order to actually do that. And then also com combining that in a small compact vid video, I think then you have like a real uh, knowledge base uh, where you have to have a nice uh, package in your head. So what were some some key learnings from that? I think my key learning is like, if you want to survive as a, maybe it could be general. If you want to survive as a Bitcoin content creator, you've got to be just insanely curious about the world and people all the time. Like you cannot be the type of person who just feels like they know everything. I mean, there's a couple maybe in Bitcoin, but again, I don't think that they last long term. You have to be just curious like yourself and all these other podcasters, like you listen to the best podcasts in the space and it's just people asking questions. They're just curious. They just want to learn about the other person on the other end of the microphone or the zoom call or the table. Um, and then when it comes to the filmmakers, they just want to jump into a topic just like completely blind and just pick up and absorb like a sponge as much as they possibly can. Um, so, you know, I've created every, everything from like, biopics of certain people to going to these like communities to see how they use Bitcoin. But all of that is just deeply rooted in just endless curiosity about like how people have achieved certain things or done certain things with their time and energy. And my hope is like as much as possible is to just bring those stories to other people to spark their curiosity. Like I, I was talking to Issa the other day, one of my least favorite comments, honestly, when I have people come to my videos is like, great video, really well done, good cinematography. Like, yeah, it's flattering. But what I would rather people say in the comment section is like, wait, how does this work? Or like, this is cool, but like, how do they handle this in this community? Or like, did this person ever do this? You know, when I'm doing a biopic, like I love it when people leave comments that are just questions. Like they watch something and they are just curious to like learn more in something that like I didn't cover in the video. Um, so, yeah, I think really like the biggest takeaway for, you know, the reason that I like making the videos, the reason that anybody should make videos in this space is like, if you have a curious itch to scratch, making a video about something is not only the best way to teach yourself, but to spark that curiosity in other people as well. I also love when, when, when you get a nice feedback back, uh, I got yesterday a comment and uh, <laughs> I laughed so hard because I have... Like, it's, it's nice. It's awesome when people are like, great hose, like you crushed it, but I love it when people ask questions because that means that they like paid attention 
and they like want to know more. Like you, you piqued their interest. You, you tickled their fancy. Like they're curious about what you're talking about and they just want to engage more. That's awesome. I had one, um, a commenter in, in my comment section that left always like such comments, like really long in deep. And I'm like, I always put his comment a little off so I can actually, um, read them in like usually re re YouTube replies like, quick when I have like 10 minutes I reply to some um, because most are quite uh, small and, and quick and, and stuff like that but there are some there that are like they write really like almost like articles as a YouTube comment and because like if you have one and a half hours of podcast and it was there was some nice things in there as you, you might do some l nice commenting there and there's one guy that kept commenting really nice stuff and at some point, I was like, hey, uh, I would really love to chat with you. And I even made a, a podcast then with him uh, just based on the comments. Mm -hmm. And this was one of the, the better performing ones. And it, it, it was so good to, to meet him. And, and we are now almost daily in, 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 uh, on a Telegram chat uh, in contact because he just was a really deep uh, thinker. And, and he took his time with, with replying. He was, he was not just like leaving a quick comment, uh, oh, hey, great channel and stuff like that. I appreciate that because that boosts generally the, the, the channel extremely, just leaving like there are some people that just leave smileys in the comments to push, uh, push the content. Uh, but this deep thinking is like, yeah, that's, that, I, I get what you're saying. Like people that actually generally get the, the content and, and try to contribute more than they even like uh, got from the video it's it's that's an amazing thing that people actually do that yeah it's an amazing feeling when you really get people to get engaged with your content and they're not just passive consumers like that is sort of the we're doing the antithesis of honestly like the TikTok stuff because the TikTok stuff it's like you watch it you're like huh swipe huh swipe oh that was weird swipe it's like there's so little to say about some of that content because it's so short and not thought provoking. And that when you do put out a long form piece of content to get that that feedback is like, wow, I'm doing something in the right direction of the values that I want for you know everyone having that long time preference, absolutely. low time preference. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I had also one uh, comment I just want to point it out because it, it was so fun for me. I have in the background here somewhere a small black dot, and someone's like, hey. Uh, I would love, like, here's a link to Amazon. Can you please uh, uh, clean your lens? And I was like, oh, sorry, it's not, it's not the lens. Like, uh, there's an actual wall behind this. I think that's like a, a, a uh, like an put in uh, graphic, but that's an, like an actual wall that I could touch. Uh, and there's like just a spot on the wall. Uh, and like, people see so nicely uh, the video. I never saw that spot before. And now every time I edit, I'm like, oh, shit, I have to paint the wall now. <laughs> oh, no. Do you rotoscope that black dot out? No, 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 I did not. Like uh, right now, I think it's still here somewhere. I cannot see it now, but it's, it's yeah, it's like exactly here. There's like a small, oh, no. small dot. <laughs> uh, and, and the thing is like, uh, I never saw it, like 200 episodes, I never saw it. But someone pointed it out like a week ago. And now I see it every time I edit the video. Oh, uh, God. <laughs> but yeah. That would kill me. So, uh, just uh, a small thing. Um, I'm curious, when did your uh, story start with waking up? I, I call it like, let's say waking up, you can call it uh, orange pilling or like uh, get it, getting uh, unplugged from, from the system. But when did you start to questioning uh, the world? I think I've always had like that value set and curiosity that I think like most Bitcoiners have. I've just had it my whole life. Um, like I've always just been really creative and I don't know, like I, I look back really far. The first time I ever got interested in politics was when Obama was running for president. I was like just starting high school at the time. And I was just so interested and captivated by this guy uh, who was just so charismatic, had this vision for the country, even though I'm Canadian, like I should have no skin in that game. Um, but it was just cool to see someone who had those like leadership qualities for the first time in my life. I, I wasn't really like, you know, used to it with Bush and then up here we had Stephen Harper or whatever. Right. So it was cool to see this politician who had a vision for something. And I think that really inspired me. And then he won the election and it was like a long shot. If you were following him from like the beginning of 2007, he was going up against Hillary Clinton. It was like, there's no way this random you know, a uh, black senator from Illinois is going to become president. Like what a long shot. Turns out he does. And then um, he gets into office and he bails out the banks 
and uh, he crushes protesters at Occupy Wall Street. And uh, then he goes and bombs Libya and Syria needlessly. And it was like, it was like a gut punch, right? I, I, I even like when Occupy Wall Street was happening, they had it not only in New York, it was like in a bunch of cities. There were just like satellite events. And it was about how like, why are we bailing out the banks with our money when they took all the risk? Like, it's unfair that we're socializing those losses. Um, Bitcoin existed back then, had no idea about it. Um, but I was like aligned to get it as much as possible. I even remember watching videos of Peter Schiff interviewing people at Occupy Wall Street and kind of like making fun of them at times, but talking about how, you know, like on a gold standard, you wouldn't be able to like infinitely leverage these assets like this and use derivatives. And I was like, okay, cool. Uh, that seems complicated. Not going to touch that. Uh, 2013, I buy Bitcoin because I had to buy something off the internet um, that required Bitcoin to buy. Uh, didn't think of it as anything beyond that at the time. It was just a tool. 2016, it shows up on my radar again. I have some leftover student loans. Um, and uh, I was like, okay, maybe I should invest. I'm like, you know, 18 now. Everyone has investments when they graduate college or something. I don't know. So I, uh, I bought Ethereum and then Bitcoin. Oops, sorry about that. I bought Ethereum and then I bought Bitcoin and then I bought some Canadian marijuana stocks. I just looked at them as investments for years at that point. So much so that I eventually decided to start doing like um, videos for those companies because I was like a filmmaker and I felt like I understood Ethereum blockchains and, and weed. And so I started a company with the sole purpose of making promotional videos for the CEOs of those types of companies. Went down the whole like blockchain is awesome rabbit hole. And then the pandemic hit in 2020. I had been holding these assets. I was doing pretty well on them for a while. Went through a cycle there. It really wasn't until Michael Saylor, guy that you interviewed on your show, um, came out and started really talking sense about what money is. It's just like an encapsulation of our energy. Um, talking about it in these more philosophical and metaphorical terms that I started to really understand, wait a second, all these issues, all these like political things I've always thought about and uh, been frustrated about in the system, I thought were independent and not connected to one another. I thought it was just person with view over here disagrees with person with view over here. There wasn't something at the root. I couldn't figure out what was really at the root of it. And then Michael Saylor in a couple podcasts just made it very clear that it's just money and mon monetary systems that drive incentives and everything. And then the domino started to fall. I realized that money is connected to the food that we eat and the food quality and fiat has a link to fiat food and fiat has a link to wars, endless wars. Fiat has a link to, um, you know, family behaviors and birth rates and all these things. And I was just, whoa, you know, that was my matrix moment where I was like, holy crap, all this stuff is connected to money, but it's very deep. And sailor is a very smart guy. How do I play a part in this? Because I, learned all these things. And then I was trying to like tell my friends and they were just saying, Julian, you're just going in circles. Like you can't like, I, I feel your passion, but I don't really understand what you're saying. And then at that point I was like, okay, I got to get my stuff together. I got to read more books. I got to improve my vocabulary. And then I will finally start making videos about this stuff. And hopefully other people will start to see what I've been seeing. So, yeah. It's really interesting. You also made a small docu, as, as I mentioned before, um, about Michael Saylor. Um, what did you learn about him that maybe other, like, I think the average Bitcoiner that is listening now to this probably saw not like five to 10 podcasts of his, uh, <laughs> I have the feeling, but what do uh, some of the Bitcoiners maybe not know about Michael Saylor? Um, that's a really good question. I, my, my biggest takeaway from doing the research into him is that He's always been a very good prognosticator of the future. Like you can go back and you can see his, the last, before Bitcoin, what he was really um, kind of into was um, the mobile wave and this idea that like mobile phones would dematerialize everything. It would dematerialize like physical books and all these like videos and all this stuff. Like it would just move to your phone and, and these things would be basically free. And he wrote a whole book on it. And then he piled all his money into Apple and he was like hundred percent right. Facebook, all these things, hundred percent right on those things. And then you go back even further back to when he founded MicroStrategy in 1994. And his whole thesis on this was that like advertising fundamentally is going to change. Like everything is going to be about data and data is going to be this gigantic commodity that like everybody is going to have to have some of. 
And so it was like, well, I'll start a firm that basically helps companies collect every bit of sales data from their inventory to their customer base, et cetera. That was the thesis of MicroStrategy. And um, the thing that was really interesting for him is, is he was so early to it that uh, you know he had his stock when he launched his company, I think it was like 94, 95. This was like before Google, I think even existed. I could be wrong, but it was within the same time frame that Google was founded, he founded MicroStrategy. Right. And Google right now is like the prognosticator of all data on all of us that exists. And that's how early he was to this trend. His stock went from like a dollar to like 3000 and it dropped 95% in like a couple days because the SEC went over after his company. And so you just see all these little like pieces and you're like, yeah, this guy was destined to find Bitcoin because he had been through the volatility. He had seen where the world was going with, with data and with the mobile wave. And um, he's just always been on on technological trends. And we just needed someone like this in the world of Bitcoin to really start explaining it better to other people. I really think, and I could be wrong here, but I, I think that the speed at which Bitcoin has been adopted over the last four years is greatly credited towards him. And this is what I mean by like the power of storytelling. Andreas Antonopoulos was probably the best orator. You could argue Max Kaiser before Michael Saylor. But clearly, they didn't break Bitcoin out of this bubble where they were being invited onto Fox News and CNBC and these big mainstream shows to explain what Bitcoin was. Michael Saylor was the first person to really do that. And it's because of his eloquence and it's because of the way that he his he speaks, his cadence, that I think goes really underappreciated. Like, we all think he's just smart for smart's sake. It's like, no, he's not only smart, he he explains things with these very visual detailed metaphors, these connections to energy and fire, and wind and all this stuff that might seem like a lot of hocus to some people, but it is like, I think the necessary step that Bitcoin needed to start entering the minds of some really important builders and individuals and other storytellers like me so that we could finally feel empowered to start explaining Bitcoin to people better. Um, I don't like hero worship, but he has that really important play, like place, I think, in Bitcoin history to play that kind of ushered and, and started this firestorm of other people really getting involved in explaining Bitcoin to other people. Really interesting. I just thought about like um, we needed like those persons that like explain Bitcoin at different stages, like uh, Andreas Andronopoulos. I think he orange built so many uh, in, in the early days. Max Kaiser, obviously, not Michael Saylor. Orange built me, uh, and th that's why it was also the interview quite meaningful to me because <laughs> the guy that literally orange me, built me a few oh. years beforehand. Uh, so, sorry, one one last note on this. The other thing that's really important to the whole Michael Saylor thing is the conviction. That conviction that he's had in all of his ideas, it's like not just saying things, but also putting his money where his mouth is. That is also a really integral component to being able to convince all these other people to also go down this rabbit hole, like seeing him put all basically all his personal wealth, all of his company's treasury into this and saying, I'm not just saying these things like I am putting 20 plus years of savings and 30 plus years of labor behind this newfound vision of what I see. Sorry. And, and he has, uh, I think he's, uh, a video was coming out where he said like, he, all his privately uh, acquired Bitcoin, I think 17,000, he said it, it, it was, he held onto them and bought more of them. So he probably has like closer to 20,000, I don't know, uh, Bitcoin at this point, uh, which is uh, just amazing that like he had such a high conviction, put everything in his life that he worked for in this new thing. Like that's that's a major thing, like that's, uh, it's a great point that you pointed it out. And uh, I, I think that's like underappreciated. Like the people are like, just, ah, yeah, he's a rich guy who puts some money in Bitcoin. No, no, like he puts his life energy. He put his, his life ass energy off. into it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's, that's, that's something uh, major. By the way, I just because you mentioned it, Google is uh, five days older than me. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, and that's why I know it uh, correctly. It's like 4th of September in uh, 1998. Uh, I don't know when when MicroStrategy is is is, is founded, but I, I know that Google is uh, like exactly five days older than me. That I, I remember that date uh, quite good. Um, the thing that I had in my mind is like, um, who will be uh, or what kind of a person will be the next Michael Saylor who who brings Bitcoin maybe to an even bigger and 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 better state? Does it has to be like a, a president of like? 
America or something like that. I I, I don't think it will be Trump. But <laughs> uh, uh, do you think like what what could be the the next evolution of of uh, of, of Michael Saylor? Uh, maybe an, an uh, Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos uh, type of guy, but Michael Zeta is all, already so high, <laughs> high on that list, right? That's a really interesting question. I, I, I don't think it can kind of happen again. Like, like there's, there's not going to be another person that buys Bitcoin and puts like all of their life energy into it that is unaware of Sailor. So all they are, if that person comes around is like a derivative of Sailor, right? And it's just like, you're telling me that like Jeff Bezos decides to put all his money in Bitcoin and he like never watched the Sailor podcast before he did that. No, it's like Sailor is now p part of the key texts of Bitcoin in some way. Again, I don't want to hero worship, but um, if we're thinking of like another like centralized figure that could bring Bitcoin to the masses, um, I think it's going to be inextricably linked to politicians now. And, and you can look at Donald Trump. Although from my observations, like I still, I've met one person this year that like didn't really know about Bitcoin and then got fully orange pilled within 24. Like almost everybody watching your show has probably bought or like kind of studied Bitcoin over the last three years and not just starting this year. Could be wrong. Um, so Donald Trump, I don't actually think really understands Bitcoin. He just goes where the incentives are. He's just, you know, he's an opportunist. I, I really don't think he cares. Also, like the guy advocates for government making Fed policies all the time. So he he doesn't, there's no way that that guy deep down in his core really believes that like a decentralized currency without like a central figurehead is is better than like a king making decisions on things. Um, he's just doing it for votes. He'll probably get some good votes out of it. He's gotten a lot of donations from it. Um, I think RFK Jr. gets it. Um, but I, I just can't imagine like there will be another significant Michael Saylor-esque figure uh, that is simply well-regarded in the Bitcoin community just for buying and talking about it. Beyond that, I can't really imagine anyone else. Someone to die. It's all of us, man. It doesn't. You don't have. There has doesn't have to be like one guy. Like it's all of us, right? Like we're all doing our. I think that's the that's the main uh, takeaway here. I think like the uh, the 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 might the probably is not like this one person, uh, but there is like many more Michael Sailors out there that will like copy him basically, uh, yeah. do his own own things with that, and and it will just be a more broader thing. One guy that I w would love to see being more bit like, like he is i think close to being a bitcoiner uh but he's not yet there but he had andreas andreas andonopoulos on like joe rogan uh i would love for him to, <laughs> to be a, a amazing bitcoiner but maybe that's uh, i also would love to see actually him interviewing michael sailor that would be an uh, awesome thing but maybe that's maybe that's just me <laughs> joe mm -hmm. rogan would be meaningful for me if, if he is actually like like he had bitcoiners on and he is um four things that bitcoiners are for like he's like kind of like this bitcoin mindset uh but i did not hear him really getting uh this this bitcoin mentality and like oh yeah bitcoin is is, is the thing but maybe that's that maybe that needs a little bit more time i think like not everyone can be obsessed by bitcoin too but still like understand and appreciate it like i i did a documentary recently on jekyll island um with you know, Ian Carroll and uh, this guy named Peruvian Bull, really smart guys that have like really dug up and understood the truth about our financial system and other things that were being lied to, both fully understand Bitcoin, right? Like really well, but like they're not realigning all of their energy towards like Bitcoin content. There's other things that people are interested in that eschew let's just say bitcoiner values that people want to just pursue as as makers or creators or purveyors i think that's totally fine like we are a different breed of psychopath that all we can talk about is bitcoin and never get bored of it um but there are tons of people out there that really 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 understand it and they're just like yeah i don't need to be the guy or the woman that that makes the videos or the shows or the books about it there's other really great orators I really want to speak about this specific issue and it just happens to not be Bitcoin. That's fine. On that note, it's really interesting that you brought that up because um, I was before in stocks and I thought about 
when I would have a stock uh, podcast, I would probably only talk about stocks. But as I have a Bitcoin podcast, I talk about so many different topics. I had one, uh, I always bring that uh, example up because in that podcast, we literally did not talk about Bitcoin. Uh, it was a podcast with Lisa Huff, uh, the, the the mother of, of Ella. Uh, and we talked, like it was her second round, the first round we talked about energy. And the second round where he she was on, we talked about parenting. Uh, because she made an interesting um, a presentation at Bitblock Boom, I think it's called. Uh, and we talked about parenting one and a half hours or one hour or something like that. Uh, and Bitcoiners loved it. Like n there was not one comment like, oh, stick to Bitcoin. No, no, we, we did not really talk about Bitcoin, but Bitcoiners like also other stuff. Like I think that Bitcoin uh, allows for you to explore other things where you can talk about all the topics that are kind of, related to Bitcoin because everything is related to money and, and the root cause of everything, like as we discussed in the beginning, is related to, to Bitcoin and, and, and the broken monetary system. But it's uh, it's interesting how you can talk on a Bitcoin podcast about parenting and it makes sense for the viewers. <laughs> mm -hmm. how, how do you see that as a, as a content creator? Like, do, do you stick with um, mostly Bitcoin? I mean, I saw some, uh, some of the shorts more that we are also touching on other topics, but then also re relating it to Bitcoin. I'm so glad you bring that up. That's literally the central thesis of Get Based. Get Based did not come together. It's three Bitcoiners who started it, but it was not to be a Bitcoin media company that just only talked about Bitcoin. The whole idea is that I think there are people that from a value standpoint, when you look at me, when you look at you, that are so similar in the values that we share and cherish and the, and the future that we want to see. They're 85% there. And there's just like that 15% is missing is just not actually knowing what Bitcoin is and how it plays into all those values. Um, the purpose of the videos that we make are to reach out to those people who are like 85% aligned with us, call them people who live, you know, off grid, call them people who have been disenfranchised by like the current system in some way during, from censorship, call them libertarians. There's so there's millions and millions of people who really appreciate looking at the world through this sovereign lens, looking at this world through the lens of like, maybe I can do X without the state. And uh, the point of the videos that we make are to bring those people into the Bitcoin sphere. So we might make a video that has nothing to do with Bitcoin, but has everything to do with Bitcoin, if you know what I mean, right? Like to talking about like the food system, talking about how education indoctrinates people and, and allows or creates an incentive for the state to become the parent of your own children. Like these are Bitcoiner themes and topics and you can work Bitcoin into the ending of the video and try and orange peel people if you want. We don't do it with every video, but the point is to start those conversations to let people know that there are people out there who have this unified mission, who are hopeful for the future, a future where the sovereign individual is awakened and the way that we execute all this is to just try and tell the stories as uniquely as possible. Having these candid conversations is awesome. Uh, we have a lot of like talking and interviewing in our videos, but the other fun ways that people get connected to this stuff is when they see you try something that pushes you outside of your comfort zone to become sovereign. Um, as of the recording of this, I, I, I'm monitoring this tweet, sorry. Um, I'm doing a video where I'm gonna try and live off of the bugs for 30 days do the world economic forum bug based diet because this is like a narrative that's been pushed that they're so good for you um you know and they use much less water and land and all this stuff and you know you can crush them into powders and they have all this the, the nutritional facts you need um but rather from going at it as a like let's just make fun of this stupid idea let's like torture myself for 30 days I'm going to make a genuine effort to, to get into the best shape of my life, to, to sleep as much as humanly possible and to eat as many bugs as I need to be healthy in 30 days to see if this is a real thing that we can all move towards or not. Um, but that type of content, it's like, again, nothing to do with Bitcoin, but everything to do with Bitcoin at the same time. Right. And I love that because when we rally around Bitcoiners and they already know the bitcoin not like there's two things in the like getting people that are not in bitcoin but aligned with our values getting into bit them getting them into bitcoin but also uh having be like being in bitcoin having that bitcoin mindset but maybe not being aware of some other things 
that's still aligned with our value maybe diet and stuff like that or exercising mm -hmm. or there's so many other topics that Bitcoin love to talk about but not every Bitcoin is, is aware of that so uh, I, I love to just bring those topics up and I think you're doing also a great job on that note I actually have uh, uh, one of my last questions you create amazing videos you do amazing um, uh, content uh, with your other partners um, what is some of like uh, maybe an, uh, a question more for, for me as a content creator. What are some of the learnings from creating contents? How do you make content? Uh, how do you see making content that people actually want to watch and actually uh, like to watch, especially like short form or long form, however, however, however you want to take it? Well, I wish I could tell you I cracked the code, but uh, I know that maybe by the time this interview comes out, you might be past me in subscribers. So my my only advice is people really care about authenticity and you have to like, that doesn't mean that you can't, you know, have fun with fiction and do things that are like surreal or hyper realistic and that everything has to be just like a person talking to the camera, like super candid conversations. It just means that like, you have to know what you actually like to put out into the world and just hope that one of those things you really love to do is also something that someone else loves to watch. Um, a lot of content creators come from the perspective of like, I'm going to just copy what's been working really well with other people. I'm just going to make something derivative. And then maybe if I just go viral, then I'll just lean into, you know, whatever people seem to actually like. Um, I think that works, but you'll get burnt out because you won't actually enjoy what you're doing. And so I'm the type of person that doesn't like schedules. I don't like making the same video over and over and over again. Um, I like doing stuff that challenges me, that pushes me outside of my comfort zone. I literally have a shirt that says seek discomfort because of that. Um, and so for me, that path has looked like self torture, uh, through weird eating. It's a path of putting on funny accents. It's a path of paying. I don't know if you can see this. This is a, this is a puppet that I, that I, it looks like Paul Krugman. If you, if you do a side by side, it looks like Paul Krugman. It's a puppet that I paid a Bitcoiner to make for me for like 170,000 sats might be the worst investment in my life because I wanted to do a funny thing where I talk to a puppet. So like, I'm the type of person I just love, I just love messing around. I love messing around with people. I love teaching people things, but I like having a ton of fun when I do this stuff. And so you got to find what you love in this space. And if you do, and if you're authentic about the way that you portray things, and if you provide value to people through the stuff that you love, you'll eventually blow up. The, the only other part to this is just consistency. So like, Find something you love doing, but that you also love doing every single week or every couple of days or every two weeks and just stick to a routine. Challenge yourself. You're doing a, a podcast or an interview every single day. Some people can't do every single day, but find a routine that works for you and push yourself. And those moments where you're like, ah, I'm like out of ideas or I'm out of people to interview. Like, no, there's always more. Surround yourself with the people you need to get those creative juices flowing and uh, consume what you can consume, you know, on Twitter without getting too jaded to keep that like idea train flowing, but just have fun with it. And, uh, you know, people will come and they will watch you for, for just being yourself as weird or as normal or as conversational as you are. My thing is I, I'm just a weirdo. I'm a total freak and I love making movies uh, that make me uncomfortable. Some of them are serious uh, and some of them are really, really weird and goofy, but someone's watching them. And uh, it's, what's my what's my favorite quote? My favorite quote of recent is like, love me or hate me. You watched. That's all you could do. Take that mentality and just run with it. Uh, I love that a lot. And I think you're very talented in that. I, for example, could not do that at all. I, I, I need a schedule. I need a I need a, a thing that I can rely on. That's why I do the podcast. Well, Robin, Robin, I tried interviewing people like you did. And I, I've done a couple of interviews, but I was doing them because I was like, well, that's what everyone else is doing in Bitcoin. They're doing these podcasts. They get these guests. They leverage their popularity off of their guest popularity. Um, and I tried it for a while. And I just found that I'm just not a good enough listener to really create these long form podcasts. Like I listen to what people are saying, but then my mind goes somewhere random. That's just who I am. Like I'm just always thinking of random shit all the time. And so I realized like I am not cut out to be a great podcast host, but it took me a while to kind of figure that out because I really wanted to do it because everybody else was doing it. And so you just got to not feel like you have to be like everyone else, do what feels authentic to you 
you obviously love this. Otherwise you wouldn't have challenged yourself to do it every single freaking day for what, 200 episodes now. So find what that is for you. You can either be a freak like me with the puppets, or you can have nice candid conversations and be super curious about how the world works through Bitcoiners and be Robin, but find out what your thing is and you'll crush it. I think I never said that on a podcast, but I had since I was like 15, 16 years old, always the dream uh, uh, to have my own daily show. Back then I had it to have it on the television. Like mm. <laughs> back then I watched like daily uh, evening shows, uh, like late night shows on the television in Austria, like some shows of that. And I loved like, I just binge watched them every day and I was really just like, oh, I stayed up at this time and then watched it like half an hour. Uh, and this, this was like the stream, like have a daily show where people actually show up and, and, and watch me every day. Uh, and so like this, this thing actually like follows me since like nine to eight years, or almost 10 years now. Uh, and it's, it's crazy. I, I, I think I, noticed that actually even if when i had it and i was like oh shit I, what i dreamed about like eight years ago i right now i have it and i did not even realize it because i, I told you my story a little bit before i just started uh, having conversations online and then i started to record them and then i did it like i didn't even, not even really challenge me myself to do it every day it just happened to be daily now i stick with it now i'm really religious like now i cannot miss any day uh, even though it's sometimes hard, but I cannot miss now, like I'm religious with it, but it started not like uh, a challenge and it felt always really natural. And I think you described it very, really good. Like you have to find something that's good and not something that is supposed to be done. Like not something like, oh yeah, I have to do a podcast because I have to do a podcast. No, you have to do a podcast if you really want to do a podcast because it's way too hard um, in order to keep it up. I still don't earn what I earned before with a part-time job. Now I do it like 70 hours a, uh, a week. So from a financial standpoint, it just doesn't make sense right now. Uh, but I love it so much. And even if if it never accumulates to anything more than that, I love it. And even if if I don't make any money and I have to I have to step back and I have to do only once a week or something like that, I still will do it maybe less because I have a day job then. <laughs> but mm -hmm. I, I love it so much. So I already pledged to that and uh, please people keep me accountable, but I will do uh, some kind of podcast till I die because I love it too much. Well, well, you know what I say too is like money chases value. If you provide value out to the world, you might start be giving it away for free. Eventually money will find its way to your value creation process in order to sustain it. And so like, some of us think that all value is like educational value. I got to do tutorials. I got to do these podcasts where people are learning things. But value is also entertaining people, making them laugh, making them cry, making them see the world in a different aspect. And these things cost different prices and you have to figure out how to make it work for you. Um, but that's what's kept me going is like, yes, I had to pay. I've, I didn't have a sponsor for years. I paid tens of thousands of dollars, tons of Bitcoin to make the videos that I did. But you have to have the faith that if you like what you do and you know that you're providing value, the money will come, right? You just have to, whatever it takes, right? Part-time job, side hustle, whatever it takes, keep it going. If you really believe in it, the money will always come. I think that's a great learning for everyone that wants to start something in Bitcoin or just wants to start something uh, in, in life in general, um, which is a perfect segue actually to my last question that is uh, now kind of the, uh, a new end routine that I ask every Bitcoiner, what is, uh, what can we learn from you besides Bitcoin and all the things that we already talked about in the, in the podcast. What can people learn from me in my life, in my, my weird life? Um, I think it's just like, just be curious about like the world as much as possible. And when you have time to sit down and self reflect, ask yourself, am I being curious enough about the state of the world? Am I learning things? Am I asking questions? And if you get to a state where you're saying more statements, you know, at a ratio of like 10 to one, than you are asking questions, then you should, you know, take a look at yourself. I honestly think that like all the best things in life, all the gratifying moments come from asking a question from pushing yourself outside of a comfort zone. And, um, if you do those, you'll find happiness and you'll find happiness without having a, a giant stack of Satoshis. Just keep asking questions about how things work. Don't be afraid of the answers. Don't be afraid to look stupid. There's so many people I know that don't ask questions out in the open because they're afraid of being stupid. Like 
I could care less, man. I really could care less about looking like an idiot online or asking a question to something basic. If I have a question about how Bitcoin works, I can't Google it. I can't find it in a book. It goes on Twitter. That's totally fine. So do with that what you will. Don't be ashamed of uh, being curious about this, the, the state of the world. Absolutely. I, I love that a lot. Um, we have entered in a podcast where the previous guest is asking a question for the next guest without knowing who the next guest actually is. And oh, I like that. That's cool. Okay. <laughs> it's, it's, like the, it's like the blockchain connecting uh, the previous guest with the next one and pointing to the next one. I, I love that I, I copied that from, oh shit, how does he, how, what's his name? A diary for CEO, uh, Stephen Bartley, the podcast. I, I love it a lot. And I was like, it's so suiting also for a Bitcoin podcast. And uh, it's a great end routine. I tried to fit, I, I really tried to like make my own thing out of it. And I was like, every change I do with that end routine, it makes it worse. So I just stick with it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but yeah, the, the question from the previous guest is, uh, what do you hate the most? Uh, that's an interesting question. What do you hate the most and love the most about Africa? What do I love the most about Africa and hate the most about Africa? Uh, the question comes from an African. <laughs> okay. Um, I think the thing I hate the most about Africa is all those leaders who keep taking IMF loans and, and destroying their countries and, uh, you know, letting, letting France get away with pillaging like so many countries in Africa. You guys got to step up. I know some countries are. You guys got to step up. You got to inform your public. You guys got to know that that like so much of Africa is being taken advantage of by France through their monetary system. Um, what do I love the most about Africa? I've never been there, but I love I love wildlife. I love that there is a spirit of conservation. Um, this will tie into my future question. There's a spirit in the people there, especially in places like Congo and Kenya, t that we as humans have a role to play in trying to preserve certain creatures. I don't think that it's necessarily right to just let, you know, the world play out and, and let creatures go extinct because that's just like survival of the fittest. I don't believe in that. I think if we can positively keep a species alive um, without intervening with the, you know, the natural flow too much, we should do that. And um, yeah, I, I really love that there's that appreciation in Africa. Amazing, I love that. Um... Before I let you go, where can people uh, ask you questions and where can people find the things that you create? Uh, you can find me on Twitter at kinetic underscore finance, but prefer if you watch all my videos on YouTube, because that is how we actually monetize these things. So you can look up get based TV on YouTube or just get based. You'll probably find it in the search bar. We make all these documentaries, shorts, culture commentary. There's new things that are going to be coming out all the time. I like to think that we're doing some of the coolest and most unique, um, really like different content in Bitcoin and beyond. So really appreciate any follows or subscribes on that. Do I get to ask a question for the next guest? Yes, you get. I usually do it uh, offline, but you can uh, ask it now also if you want. Okay. So my question for the next guest, and it ties in with the whole Africa thing, is I've been going down this libertarian rabbit hole trying to figure out like minimizing the state at all costs. How can we do all the services and stuff we have in society without the state? Should we give it to the free market? How, so my question is this, do you think that the free market can handle conservationism and parks and recreation? Or do you think that the government has to handle those things? Interesting. Yeah. I love it. I'm already looking forward to, to discussing that with the next uh, uh, podcast guest. Really cool. Uh, thank you for uh, joining us today, uh, Julian. Thank you for uh, uh, giving us the question and the time. Uh, also, thank you for everyone watching and listening. As, as always, I'll be back tomorrow with another episode. So bye-bye. Thanks so much, Robin. You're a rock star, man. I can't believe you do these every day. <laughs>